Okay, good. Uh, good morning. Um, today, I um, I would like to talk about something completely different than uh, than yesterday. I'm I'm glad that I didn't scare away everybody, so there's still some people in the audience. Um, so I would like to talk more about uh, the theoretical foundations of uh, tensor networks, and um, and uh, especially talk about something that has been well known in, uh, in physics for a long time, namely matrix port operators or transfer matrices, something like uh, that, uh, a, a topic that people have been studying for uh, since the 50s, basically starting with uh, Kramers and Vanier and then Onsager and many other uh, people. I guess that uh, there will be some uh, uh, overlap uh, of my talk with the talk that uh, uh, Nishida will give tomorrow, um, but um, I hope that this uh, that's not too much overlap. So what I would like to um, talk about, uh, what, what I would like to work towards in this talk is, is, to, uh, um, is to show that matrix product operators, and um, yeah, this, yeah, I think you, you have already seen this because they were already introduced in many talks uh, before, but that somehow the, um, the, that there's some kind of an extremely nice algebraic structure in, uh, uh, in these matrix product operators that allows you to basically start classifying phases of matter. Uh, to understand topological order, to understand what onions are, uh, and so further. Um, but um, before uh, I will do this, I'll actually also kind of sketch lots of applications of matrix product operators before somehow I go to uh, topological order, namely like uh, connections with the beta ansatz. Because uh, uh, the titles of my talk were clearly uh, the thermodynamic beta ansatz, so I have to, uh, I have to talk about this. Um, um, anyway, um, Please interrupt me. Please ask questions, um, and uh, uh, because this is a school, and I, uh, I would be very glad. This so, okay. So the outline of this talk, um, I will give examples of transfer matrices and matrix product operators, and show that indeed, actually, this whole topic of of tensor networks is, is actually something that everybody knows in one or the other way. Because if you everybody that does part and integrals effectively works with matrix product operators. Okay, so, so we just call it matrix product operators, but you could call it anything else. Okay, so this is just, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's everywhere in, in, in many body physics. It's completely unescapable, actually, if you do many body physics, uh, to start working with matrix product operators. Um, then I will kind of um, um, explain how to obtain normal forms of matrix product operators. Okay, so what is, uh, uh, what are canonical forms and so, and you will see that there's actually something, some non-trivial things to be said there. You would think, well, well, everything is known, you have canonical forms. And indeed, if somehow, just as in the case of matrix product states, if matrix product operators are injective, then everything is very simple. But actually, the matrix product operators become extremely interesting when they are not injective. Okay? When there's something non-injective, then there's a much richer algebraic structure there, and that's exactly the algebraic structure that you need uh, to start describing uh, topological order and actually also the beta and um, And then I will kind of show that indeed if you have a matrix product operators with the special features that namely they form like a closed algebra independent of the size of your matrix product algebra that somehow you can really derive and can really understand very well the unboxed equations uh, but also tensor fusion categories, onions, all of this is in this language. So I myself I didn't know anything about let's say tensor fusion categories but I kind of understood a little bit about uh, matrix product operators, and this is, from my point of view, by far the simplest way of, of, of understanding this whole business of topological order. And it's doing also new things, namely starting to construct exactly exp explicit kind of representations of the onions that are present in these um, topological theories. Um, okay, so what is a matrix product operator? So um, this is typically the way we write it. So we have it's just the same as a matrix product state. You have seen this many, many times, but there's like both legs, uh, there's the both legs above and below. This is because it's an operator and not a state. Okay, that's the only difference. Okay, so the expression just you have this operator, it's a trace of product of matrices, and these, these matrices have actually two indices. So this is of course A, alpha, beta, I, J, and this I is like say the index up, and J is the index down. You take the trace of this, multiply what's on border, because it might actually, you will see that in some cases, this, uh, um, this matrix that you have to put there is not trivial to get something interesting and then somehow you close the whole thing. Okay, so uh, matrix product operators are characterized by the tensor Aij alpha beta. Somehow small d I call the physical dimension, the dimension of the, 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 the small indices, the, the i and j indices, 
big D I call the virtual dimension. And uh, you can actually check that the dimension of the corresponding manifold is D squared minus 1 times big D squared. And not small D squared and big D squared as somehow the number of parameters in A suggest. And this, of course, has to do with the fact that there's gauge transforms. So again, these gauge transforms that many people have talked about to bring things in left order and all and forth, they happen exactly the same. And what is this? This is this, this D squared parameters that you have subtract, to subtract. They're actually the parameters that you can multiply this A on the left with an X and from the right with an X minus 1. And then you see this disappears in this trace as long as somehow this X um, um, times M times X minus 1 is equal to uh, the identity, and typically we will take this M and D the identity. And that's why some other dimension of this manifold has this kind of thing. Anyway, matrix point operators pop up everywhere um, um, in many body systems, and uh, you can just look at a system with a tensor product structure. If you have a system with a tensor product structure, they will be there, okay? Like partition function and statistical physics. You all kind of are familiar with this, I think. Like if you look at the classical Ising model, that uh, at the end, how did Onsager solve the Ising model in 2D, the classical Ising model in 2D, by basically saying, I have my full kind of partition function, and then I have this transfer matrix, and the kind of free energy, uh, the exact expression of the free energy can be obtained by diagonalizing this matrix product operator or this transfer matrix, maybe finding the leading eigenvalue of that transfer matrix, and that's exactly how uh, all problems in statistical physics uh, that have exact solutions have been kind of tackled maybe by diagonalizing matrix product operators. But as I will kind of show you in some examples, there's also extremely somehow more kind of combinatorial problems that can be written in this form. Okay, and again, this is extremely well known in statistical physics, but nevertheless I would like to kind of show you because it's such a, it's so nice if you know about matrix product operators, you know how to diagonalize them because that's of course so the, the, the thing that I talked about yesterday are exactly kind of tools to diagonalize, to find leading eigenvectors of Hamiltonians or of, of matrix product operators. That's exactly this time-dependent variation principle or any other kind of DMRG-related method. Uh, but you can also solve, you can start using these methods for, um, um, for, 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 uh, for um, combinatorial problems. And uh, the great thing of these stats and networks, and that's something that I somehow never appreciated that much um, uh, before, um, is, is that that actually with tensor networks you can um, actually calculate from classical statistics and mechanical problems you can calculate the entropy, you can calculate the free energy and once you have the free energy of course you can deduce what the entropy is and this is something that is extremely hard typically to do uh, with standard methods for dealing with statistical physics like with, uh, with, uh, with Monte Carlo methods with normal Monte Carlo methods it's very easy to sample to calculate expectation values but it's very hard to actually calculate entropies, global kind of things, because the relative things are very easy, but global kind of calculate the value of the partition function, you really have to, uh, it's much, much harder in Monte Carlo than just calculate expectation values of local observables. Again, this is well, I think if people are familiar with this, they know very well why this is. Uh, but in the case of these standard network methods, this is completely not true. So the, you immediately have somehow, once you diagonalize this transfer matrix, you have the largest eigenvalue, and somehow this immediately gives you the free energy. And uh, there must, there's probably plenty of applications in uh, statistical physics where this could be relevant. You know, that tensor so I feel that somehow this, this, uh, these tensor networks have not been used um, um, enough in, in somehow using classical statistical physics. And this is certainly something that, of course, uh, Tomotoshi has been uh, advocating also already for many years, but somehow I think we would like to, yeah, to, to re emphasize this. this is, I think this is very cool. Um, actually, also in non equilibrium uh, physics, um, uh, matrix product operators um, pop up everywhere. Um, so there is this um, um, whole school of people that are trying to model traffic uh, um, by, um, by basically saying, look, I have um, a lattice, okay, I have a line, and then I've, you know, I discretize basically my, my, my traffic lane into boxes. Okay, and if there's a car, I put a one, if there's no car, I put a zero. Of course, there's many other kind of cases where this is relevant, but this is the easiest for me to picture. And then these kind of um, particles can hop, okay, they can hop in one direction with a certain probability. And this is a non-equilibrium, this is called, uh, well, this is non-equilibrium, and this is, uh, because somehow, that's a stochastic process. Okay, but, so what you're interested in is, is given somehow the boundary conditions, um, what is the steady state of such kind of a distribution? Because with a certain probability particles hop, with another probability they stay together. And obviously, if there's a particle in front of you and you're there, you cannot hop. So that makes it a very strongly interacting kind of classical system of, uh, of, 
uh, of particles. And it turns out that somehow, well, you're, so that means that, uh, that, that the whole physics of this thing is described by the steady study, the, the steady state physics, the traffic or somehow the, the, the transport is described by looking at the steady state uh, solution of the probability distribution um, um, of, that, of that whole process, which is again somehow um, a, a problem that has exponentially many degrees of freedom, no? because at every site there can be a particle or not. So what you have is a probability distribution uh, depending on I1, I2, I3, and so further. So in total, if you have like n boxes, there's obviously 2 to the n possibilities. Okay? So you have 2 to the n possible configurations of this thing. And you're interested in the steady state, what is the probability of having one of these configurations? It turns out that all the exact solutions uh, of these problems, um, let's say the, the, the easy type of models for these magnetic equilibrium states, all the exact solutions are exactly given in terms of these matrix uh, operators and matrix product states. This, is, uh, uh, this was kind of advocated as, uh, by, uh, by people like uh, Bernard Derrida and so further. But it's kind of very intriguing that, that matrix product operators, or matrix product states and matrix product operators pop up so naturally in these. Uh, these problems. And again, it's not really a surprise because this is a problem with the tensor product structure that has some notion of locality because somehow the, the, the only terms in your Liouvillian are basically local. No? They tell you that if somehow there's, a part, there's no particle here, there's a particle here, it can hop with a certain probability. But if there's a particle here and there, they cannot hop. Okay? So there's, a lo there's some notion of locality, there's a tensor product structure. And that's why you expect that, uh, that made exploring states are going to play a role and indeed somehow the exact solutions of these problems are exactly different things. Uh, this thing. Also, patent eagles. Um, if you think about the patent eagle uh, of a Hamiltonian with nearest neighbor interactions, um, this is, of course, you can understand this by, uh, let's say, the, 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 the Trotter Suzuki, uh, the Suzuki kind of, you, you can do some, some Trotter expansion of your, your patent eagle and you immediately get, uh, um, get somehow these matrix product operators. Maybe your patent eagle is nothing more than a product of many of these kind of things. And again, exactly the same story. All the physics is basically end up eigen. Uh, values and eigenvectors of this um, uh, transfer matrix. Okay, so let me kind of first talk a little bit uh, about statistical physics. Okay, so uh, take the classical Ising model, the 2D classical Ising model, and you're interested in basically the partition fraction. Okay, so this is the sum over all possible configuration of spin one halves e to the minus beta h uh, function of the spins. Okay, and um, so the partition fraction is given by the contraction of this tensor network. So you take this tensor. And this tensor is very simple. It's basically, it, this tensor should encode somehow the energy that, uh, uh, that a certain configuration has. And um, so what you want to do is to basically imagine that, um, um, that, that your physical um, spin somehow, so, 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 so why, why is it of this form? So what, what you see is that um, somehow you, you associate a spin to this side, you associate a spin to this side, and if these two spins are equal, you give it the weight e to the beta. If they are not equal, you give it the weight e to the minus beta. And um, you can easily see that, uh, um, that uh, this tensor, choosing this tensor equal to this, which is extremely simple, well, there's an extremely, form, an extremely simple form of this, this tensor, gives you exactly, somehow it gives you this tensor network, and that somehow the value of that tensor network, if you contract the whole thing, because there's no physical indices everywhere, anywhere, you know, it's a, it's a classical problem, that, that somehow if you contract this whole thing, that is exactly gives you the number z. And what you're interested in is basically, somehow the z will be something exponential in the system size, and you're interested in quantifying or kind of finding out what is this z, somehow basically the, 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 the log of z divided by the number of sites will be somehow an uh, intensive quantity. Okay, that's a free energy per site. And this will exactly be somehow the encoded in, this, uh, in, the, in the leading eigenvalue of such a matrix product operator. That itself, of course, will be exponential in the number of sites that you have here. Okay, is this, is this clear? So please, please interrupt me now if, if, I'm, uh, uh, if what I say doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense. But somehow the nice thing is that it's, so, so all this classical statistical physics, you just have to do any Hamiltonian, give me any kind of Hamiltonian uh, you can immediately kind of translate this in terms of, uh, uh, of a matrix product operator uh, or, or kind of a, uh, yeah, some kind of a tensor network uh, that consists uh, out of kind of matrix product operators that always multiply to each other and then somehow the whole problem, the whole statistical physics problem can be solved by diagonalizing these uh, matrix product operators. Okay, so um, let's actually Look at the different problem. So, 
Um, so again, these are all very well known problems in statistical physics, but somehow I think it's cool to to, 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 to phrase them in terms of these stats and networks because it's indeed such an such a kind of an obvious uh, way. So for example, you can uh, consider a square lattice. Okay, so consider a square lattice. And a very famous uh, problem, uh, accounting problem, a combinatorial problem is asking, look, if I have dimers, dimers are some kind of things that act on two sides. Okay, they can be, uh, they, uh, if you have a lattice. Then the question, so, so dimers are effectively uh, some objects that live on two sides. Okay, so for example, this is a one possible diamond configuration. Okay, and this and so further. So something that acts on two sides, and of course there's nothing around it. And the question is how many different ways are there to kind of put dimers on a square lattice? Okay, so this is uh, just a counting problem. This is really about counting how many kind of, of these dimers there are. And actually this turns out to be uh, that this, this number of dimers is, uh, is exponential. And you can easily convince yourself that if you take a tensor network with this a, i, j, alpha, beta being equal by this kind of configuration, this means that somehow this thing is zero um, for all different configurations, like zero, 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 one, or whatever, one of these kind of things, then it's zero, and for the non-zero entries of this matrix are just the ones where there's three zeros and one one. So, and so, um, so it's a very simple exercise to see that actually this tensor will kind of give you exactly the counting of the number of dimer configurations that you have uh, in, 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 in the lattice. And so why is this? So this, this one, so what you see is that on every, on every of, these, uh, um, of, of these vertices, somehow you have to associate, is there a dimer uh, in what direction? So, this, so for example, if th in, in this case, I would associate a zero here, zero here, zero here, and a one there. Okay, they're saying there's no dimers here, here, and here, but there's a dimer in this direction. What you have to see is that on this side, this has to match with another kind of tensor that would also say that it, there's exactly a one here, but if there's a dimer in this direction, there should not be dimers in the other direction. Okay, so because this is a one, then the other ones have to be zero. And of course, because this is a superposition, this would just count all the things that are compatible. So you contract this whole tensor network, and this will exactly give you this number of total number of dimers that you have uh, on the lattice. And it's kind of nice that this is, I mean, this is an extremely simple kind of tensor. Turns out that in this case, actually, you can do this analytically. Okay? So there's a, there's, you can use the beta ansatz to, uh, to actually solve this. So you can actually even turn it into uh, to a free fermion problem if you're. Uh, uh, this is this, so far, this is very famous Castelline for the uh, Castelline uh, for the. Well, yeah. cast line for the, uh, <laughs> and uh, actually also you can you can actually also modify modifications, um, and you can uh, so the easiest way by far to to, to treat this is by uh, um, by so once you have this matrix blocked operator by kind of doing a Jordan Winger transformation on this and then you get an exponential of a quadratic Hamiltonian and then you can kind of use the typical uh, tools or tricks that are uh, very similar to the classical easing model to basically calculate the number of configurations here. But somehow, of course, you can slightly modify this or you can easily generalize this and somehow all these things like to, to, to maybe a timer with a spin or with some kind of, you add some fugacity and all this, and this will just slightly modify this. Uh, Another problem that is very famous in statistical physics, and again, has an extremely simple kind of representation in terms of these, uh, um, uh, of these matrix product operators, is uh, calculating the entropy of spin i's on the square lattice. Okay, so what is this, uh, um, uh, this problem? The problem of, uh, of spin i's is, um, uh, is, is like, again, I have a square lattice, uh, and it's, it's a slight modification of this, of this dimer problem. So instead of having dimers, now you say in every kind of lattice side, there should be two, you put arrows on all the edges. And on every kind of uh, vertex, there should be the total number of in-pointing arrows should be even. Okay, on the square lattice, and the total number of arrows, somehow that kind of point in is zero, two, or four. Okay, and this gives you somehow, so that there's some possible <laughs> configuration. And if you count, it means that there's actually six possible configurations possible. Okay, there's six, six possible ways of... Uh, this um, should be excluded. Sorry? This should be excluded. Why? So two should ah. be in, two should go out. Oh yeah, I need to need time. I remember this is the eight, this yeah, is the eight, 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 e
two things going in and two turns. So yeah. the, there's two arrows going in, two <coughs> arrows going out. And that's the problem of spin out. Of course, if you, this, this previous thing, you could, this would be the eight vertex, and of course, it would be a slight modification. But this is the six, the so called six vertex model, indeed. Because there's six possible ways of having two. So if you, if you write down two zeros, the zeros would be kind of point in, the ones point out. There's obviously six possible configurations, and if you write down this tensor in this way, obviously, somehow you get this. Of course, somehow, by writing this as a matrix point operator, you have not solved anything. Right? And, and again, this is all kind of completely obvious. This, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that this is very deep or anything. You know? I'm just showing that it's very natural, if you have a problem like this, to think about matrix probe operators or transfer matrices and kind of that the whole problem of calculating of this kind of doing this counting. Because at the end, this is nothing more than a combinatorial problem. But solving the combinatorial problem is completely equivalent to diagonalizing basically this matrix probe operator. And all these techniques that people have um, um, developed uh, for for finding ground state of Hamiltonians actually can all kind of be kind of also also immediately used for finding leading eigenvectors of these uh, um, of these transfer matrices. And again, the really cool thing of somehow these techniques with matrix product state is that it allows you to calculate entropies. And this is something that is typically very hard. Okay, so for Monte Carlo methods, which are the standard methods, of course, for dealing with in statistical physics, they 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 don't immediately allow you to calculate entropies. Okay, they allow you to sample quantities, but not to calculate entropies. Uh, of course, there are techniques that's possible with Monte Carlo, but it's actually typically very uh, hard. Uh, and actually, to go talk about Monte Carlo, the original problem of um, um, of of, uh, of Monte Carlo um, had to do. So the very first paper uh, in which somehow the Metropolis algorithm was introduced was also kind of used for a problem that is very similar to these kind of counting problems. Namely, they kind of considered a box with hard disks. And they asked basically what is the entropy of this system. So there's there's basically no Hamiltonian there. Okay, there's no Hamiltonian, just kind of how many different configurations are there to put like a possible hard disk. So these are disks with a certain kind of, 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 of size. So you have a box here and you put kind of disks here. And the question is what is the number of configurations that you have for a given effect for a given density of uh, um, um, disks. Okay, so given somehow a number of disks. How many possible disk configurations are there? So, what is the entropy of this uh, uh, this system? This is actually what uh, what Monte Carlo, what 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 this problem is about. Okay, trying to kind of count the number of, of configurations that this thing has. And uh, of course, a baby version of this half this problem can be uh, immediately obtained by kind of writing down a matrix product operator or somehow and then uh, um, somehow uh, a lattice version where you say that if somehow I have somewhere a one. Then somehow, this, because this has a certain kind of size uh, around it, we all must have kind of zeros. Okay, so whenever you have like a spin one, then the neighboring ones must all be zero. Or you can also say also the second nearest can be zero, and then this is a slight modification. And then you say, what is the number of configurations that I can write down with this property? And all these kind of modifications can immediately be written down in this form. You kind of just write down in this particular case with the nearest neighbor. In fact, you see this is some how matrix product operator. And then you want to solve this problem, well, you just have to diagonalize basically this MPO. Do you have a question? Well, uh, I mean, it's clear how to rewrite it, but like once you have it in this uh, matrix product operator form, is it immediately clear how to solve it? Well, the problem is just to find the leading eigenvalue of the transfer matrix. And that gives you the entropy of the system. And what you will see is that in this particular case, there will be a phase transition as a function of the density. But, but finding it is still difficult. Well, it's the same. If, no, with matrix block states, actually, typically, the, the, all the, the MPS techniques allow you to find these eigenvectors very easily. For the Daimler model, et cetera, the, they're critical. And yeah, but, but we know that it's not because it's critical that this doesn't work. No, DMRG works even even if it's critical very well. No? You, in practice, somehow you just solve it and you can. Well, yeah, sure. But in practice, it works very well. At the moment, one dimension 200 smallest tree value Okay, so that's the Sorry, Frank, can you explain better the last notation for. for uh, I have to think myself. Um, yeah, well, there's many different ways in which you can write this. No, but so this is a, a four index object. And uh, so we have ij, alpha, beta. And what this means is that this is a product of three things. So uh, um, um, this matrix tells you that i has to be equal to alpha because it's diagonal. And if i and alpha are equal to 0, you get a 1. And if i and alpha are equal to 1, it's a p. So this is like the fugacity of your kind of uh, problem. It gives you somehow this p will control the density of 
kind of particles. Okay, so uh, and then what this tells you that I and J, this, 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 this matrices I and J are equal to, uh, um, so if, if you have, if I and J are both equal to uh, 1, this is 0, and if they are not equal, or, uh, I'm sorry, if, yeah, if they are 0, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0, then it's just a 1, and the same thing for this alpha and beta. And it's a very simple exercise to kind of write this out and see that indeed this will kind of solve this problem at hand. Um, so I think it's actually so uh, it's actually a cool problem to uh, um, of course there's much more advanced ways of, of problems like this. No, this is like the one with the nearest name, but then you have next nearest name and so further and so on. And it's a uh, it's a non it's a non obvious problem to to write down basically what is the what is the matrix called operator with the smallest bond dimension that I need that would be able to kind of encode that uh, that problem. Okay, so. Uh, let me also talk a little bit about this non-equilibrium physics thing that I kind of, this traffic problem that I told you uh, um, about. So in, principle, in some sense, this is uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, right or kind of technical term for this are probabilistic cellular automata. Okay, so, so, um, um, so they are basically mapping probability function of n bits to other kind of probability distributions. Okay, so, uh, so the typical kind of things that you have there are like percolation, asymmetric exclusion processes, this traffic kind of thing. So what you have is kind of basically some description of, uh, um, of, of a stochastic matrix in the form of a matrix product operator that maps a probability distribution to a probability distribution. And you're interested in the leading eigenvector of that kind of thing that always has eigenvalue 1. So in this particular case, you know what the leading eigenvalue is, but you're just interested in what is the eigenvector. Okay? Because once you have the eigenvector, the leading eigenvector, of your stochastic process, you can deduce all the uh, all the information and uh, and uh, like percolation is a typical example of this. Okay, so you're like interested in what is the eigenstructure of such an MPO? You can immediately write down somehow these MPOs for the whole problem of uh, uh, of, of, of percolation, but also somehow this uh, um, and these non-equilibrium phase transitions that occur in all these kind of examples, because that's of course why these are such interesting problems now, because there are actually phase transitions going on in these systems. So these, uh, these non-equilibrium phase transitions will happen when the matrix part operators become scapeless. Okay, so, uh, uh, and then you have corresponding critical exponents, so this is exactly also what Frank kind of talked about, of course, that, that he said, okay, well, how do you diagonalize it? The interesting case is where this becomes critical, but that's exactly, we know that, that that, that somehow things work, even in, even in the case of a critical system we have, we can diagonalize this using matrix product states and uh, then do some scaling as a function of the bond dimension or whatever to extract uh, uh, critical exponents. Although we saw on Monday that somehow there's uh, sometimes it's not so easy, you know, there's, there's certain problems uh, for which um, 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 things are hard, but that's, that's, uh, that makes it of course also more interesting. Okay, so uh, and then you have this kind of direct percolation universality class. Somehow these phase transitions are also related to kind of traffic jams. Somehow this is really when somehow the eigenstructure of this thing changes. When you change a small parameter, you change one parameter a small uh, in this in this in this stochastic process, and suddenly somehow the eigenstructure changes completely. That's exactly what uh, a phase transition uh, is about. Excuse me. Yes. For example shown by you is a positive uh, element. In such case, we can apply the more thorough technique or something. However, is there, uh, is there a very big difference between the some element is negative or positive? Element? Yes, so, so certainly for, um, for the standard techniques in statistical physics, indeed, it's very important that these things are positive, okay? because that's exactly that allows you to do actually Monte Carlo methods using this without having a sign problem. Um, but for the techniques that, uh, these tensor these networking techniques, namely that diagonalizes matrix product operators, it actually does not, not important. The fact that these are positive or negative, because indeed I will immediately give you examples where these things are not positive. Okay, like, uh, then uh, it, it does, this is not, this is immaterial actually for these matrix product state techniques. You don't, this is not important whether this, 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 there's a sign problem or there's no sign, this is not, this, this is not really relevant if you diagonalize these things using matrix product state techniques. Uh, but, uh, that's a very good, that's a very good question. In fact, it is not positive. The leading eigenvalue has very little sense. No, no it's always the, the leading eigenvalue is always the same. It's, it's always the quantity of interest. No, because it's you multiply this matrix product operator with itself infinitely many times. That means that the partition function or whatever is always governed by the leading eigenvalue. If you have a matrix 
and you take a very large power of that matrix because that's what it is. No, this is nothing more than a big, big matrix. You take this matrix to a large power. At the end, the only thing that will survive is the leading eigen, the, the leading, the, the, the eigenspace corresponding to the leading eigen eigen. Again, the, whether this is kind of unique or degenerate and so forth, this is exactly what, what will distinguish somehow the, um, the, the different phases. So, so like symmetry breaking will happen when somehow this eigenstructure is, becomes actually degenerate. So, so typically you have a unique eigenvector and then at some point uh, it becomes too full degenerate. That's exactly when you have symmetry breaking of whatever number of degenerates. So this is uh, so. So all the, the physics can be, be, be understood by looking at the like structure of this. But again, so so what I'm saying is not is, it's not it's not deep at all. But I think for a school, it's useful that that you have this in mind that actually all these matrix strong state techniques can actually also be applied to these to these problems. And again, that, that somehow using these matrix product state techniques, we can calculate entropies. And I think this is something that has not been explored at all. Okay, and then, because that's actually the hard problem if you use the, the standard. Uh, the standard techniques for uh, for dealing with such uh, things. Okay, different thing like uh, patenting representations of ground states. How do kind of these uh, matrix product operator things come out there? So um, so let's for example consider an arbitrary Hamiltonian with, with with nearest neighbor interactions actually for uh, uh, for quantum spin system and and that's somehow what uh, the typical way that uh, people in quantum fields really look at such problems is they say hi let's write down the patent and uh, and let's try to find out what this is. So, so what you write down is exponential minus beta h uh, acting on psi zero with beta going to infinity. Well, you see that indeed this is like, uh, this will kind of basically be a representation of the ground state of that uh, model. And then what you do is basically you structurize this, uh, this exponential minus beta h into, uh, okay, there's many, many different ways in which you can structurize. You want to write this down as a sum of kind of different terms that don't commute, but as a sum of terms that all commute with each other, plus another term of, of all terms that commute with each other, but these two different blocks don't commute with each other, and then you use basically the, uh, the Trotter-Suzuki formula, and uh, you immediately arrive at such a touch of network, and that's exactly somehow um, what, what, what the ground state, this is an exact representation of the ground state of your spin system, and you just have to evolve this infinity long, and the eigenvector of that transfer matrix will exactly be the ground state of the problem that you're uh, interested in. And this is exactly somehow the, of course, the, 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 the thing that, many, I, that, that everybody knows is that indeed somehow that the, the, the quantum physics, let's say, in, this is like describing the quantum physics of 1D is effectively equal to classical statistical physics in 2D. Okay? Because you really get an extra dimension which is related to this kind of time direction. And this is the matrix product state or the matrix product operator for of your, your, your ground state. Okay? And in this case, these tensors certainly are not positive. Okay, so these 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 matrix product operators have kind of coefficients that are not positive. Of course, it could be that they are all positive, and that's exactly the case where you can start using Monte Carlo techniques for simulating this. So what quantum Monte Carlo does uh, is nothing more than write down your state like this, and then put the resolution of the identity on all these edges. Okay, put the resolution of the identities on all these edges, and then start sampling this whole kind of sum, and that's how you kind of get around. With, uh, this is what 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 what, what Monte Carlo is. So so it's. it's it's all kind of very much related, and, uh, and, and, and again, somehow the purpose of this is trying to, 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 to let you see that actually this matrix product state of matrix product operators, they, they are there, and everybody knows them, and, but, but somehow it's not entirely, maybe not, it's not entirely obvious that it's uh, uh, like um, um, this. Okay, so um, um, another kind of case where uh, matrix product operators um, um, play uh, uh, an extremely important role is, of course, in the kind of in these ansatzes of tensor network states, or like this projected entangled pair states. This is certainly uh, how I got very interested in all this. Because somehow, if you write down a PEPS, well, it's nothing more than a tensor network exactly like the ones we had before, but there's actually an extra physical leg on every vertex. So you have this vertex with four kind of legs, but then there's one extra physical degree of freedom. And uh, the um, this is the kind of the, 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 the quantum state, and if you kind of now would like to calculate uh, an expectation value, you will have to take this uh, state, kind of put the bra or the, the conjugate of that state on top of it, and then you will see that somehow the, that this looks very much like the partition function of a classical statistical mechanical problem. So, so calculating expectation values with perhaps is not ex is exactly the same thing again. It's, it's nothing more than diagonalize a matrix product operator 
uh, which makes it, that has maybe a bigger bond dimension, but at the end, that's the central problem. Just it's about diagonalizing matrix product operators. Now, what is really important from the from the more conceptual point of view is 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 what the meaning is of these virtual indices. Okay, so this this is a quantum state and it has this kind of bond dimension, this certain bond dimension. Well, somehow what uh, what these bond dimensions mean? These are the so-called entanglement. This is what we call the entanglement degrees of freedom. So what you have is like a tensor with uh, uh, some virtual indices. Well, these kind of virtual indices are exactly somehow kind of transforming correlations or quantum correlations between the different sides. So what this means is that somehow if you kind of cut open, you take a PEPS and you cut open your kind of lattice and you leave all these outside indices open, these are exactly the entanglement degrees of freedom. Okay, that means that actually the eigenvector of this matrix product operator lives in a Hilbert space that is actually a one-dimensional Hilbert space. And this is exactly kind of describing somehow the an, an Hamiltonian or somehow a physics in one dimension lower, and this is exactly kind of describing the entanglement degrees of freedom of your full system. Okay, and, uh, and then starting from this, I think I think Norbert will also kind of talk much more about uh, this tomorrow. Is kind of trying to understand indeed what is this kind of corresponding Hilbert space? What is the meaning of this Hilbert space that kind of arises there? Because you have the physical Hilbert space, which are these blue kind of legs sticking out here, but then you have the virtual kind of Hilbert space that is one dimension lower, which encodes all the entanglement degrees of freedom. It turns out that symmetries and all this the use of these of these virtual degrees of freedom are crucial in understanding. Uh, the physics of uh, at hand of your uh, full um, system. Okay, but let's uh, let me make this a little bit more precise. How to connect this to the things that we said before? So, uh, so you have this kind of one tensor, this PEPS tensor, which has like five legs. And um, um, if you calculate expectation values, or well, anyway, the, all the physics of the given the PEPS, so you're interested in the physics, like what is the correlation length, what are the kind of what, what is the what what the part the the, 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 the well whatever you, the, the, the the, the number, the types of excitation in the system, all this will basically be encoded in the eigenstructure of your kind of uh, transfer matrix, which has nothing more than, than basically taking your state, taking the conjugate on top of it, then you get rid of these physical degrees of freedom, because you basically sandwich, you, have, you contract it over this index, that this is this physical index that you contract over, you get this matrix product operator, and this is nothing more than something ex exactly the same as we had before, uh, but now we just uh, uh, Kind of a dimension that is that is larger, and also this um, uh, in the case of PEPS explicitly, there is something like a non-trivial um, structure there. So there's a notion of positivity here. So the elements of this thing are not positive, but there is still some notion. It's like uh, it's an operator. There's an operator kind of version of positivity here because somehow if you take a tensor and you kind of multiply here with somehow the conjugate on top of it, then this is actually called uh, a completely positive map. Okay, so it's like this thing in the case of PEPS is maybe elements-wise not positive, but there's some operator, there's, there's some kind of positive semi-definite feature of this tensor here, and uh, something that, uh, ha that and this is something that uh, that certainly has has bothered me for a long time that we have never been able to exploit this. The fact that this is positive should be exploitable to make it more efficient. Okay, so um, so so there's some some feature there that that when well, you just forget about it. Now, typically, if you do PEPS, you can calculate this, contract this, and uh, and just try to find the leading eigenvector, and you completely forget that actually there's some internal structure here that is uh, um, um, that is positive. Um, so I certainly have tried myself many many times or many years already to to exploit this and uh, maybe to find basically some purification or to, to find instead of kind of diagonalizing this, kind of diagonalizing something in the single layer level. Because the, the complexity of this is now that actually this, these bond dimensions are basically squared, no? because every virtual bond dimension is not kind of having it once. You have it twice now, so the dimension of this Hilbert space or this, 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 this space associated to this is basically squared. And you would really like to kind of deal or do it all the things in somehow the single layer picture without having to kind of double this, because computa this computationally this is really the bottleneck in all these PEPS calculations, namely the fact that these bond dimensions grow very fast and uh, the diagonalization of this is very kind of expensive and so forth. We'd really like to exploit the fact that this is positive, but somehow um, uh, till now we don't have much success. But you will see later in this talk that actually this, uh, this, this structure will be exploited a lot for understanding the algebraic structure of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of, uh, of tensor networks that describe um, 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 topological phases of, uh, of matter. Um, so are there any questions about this first part? Because I would like to move now to uh, the second part that has to do with, uh, uh, with matrix product operators and namely the, 
Uh, well, the algebra is also first. I think I will probably say one slide about how to diagonalize these things. Yes? Is there like an area law for the transfer operator for a um, This is certainly, um, well, the, actually, this has nothing to do with this perhaps, no, but, uh, but um, it's, it's more general if you have a, well, okay. So if given a, so, so the, the question is, a matrix product operator is in some sense the, 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 the statistical mechanics analog of a, of a local, of a Hamiltonian with nearest neighbor interactions. Okay, so, and we know that for um, Hamiltonians with nearest neighbor interactions um, in, in, in 1D, that if this Hamiltonian is gapped, that the ground state can be well approximated using matrix product states. Okay, so this has already been mentioned by many people in many talks, and this is something that well, was understood already very early on from the quantum information theory perspective, and then was actually proven rigorously uh, by Matthew Hastings, namely that, that, that this is so-called, well, that, that indeed, given a matrix, given a Hamiltonian with nearest neighbor interactions that is gapped, well, this implies that effectively the ground state of that Hamiltonian can be well represented uh, by a matrix product state, and that's, of course, uh, a crucial kind of element in all these proofs of classifying phases of matter in 1D. Because if you're interested in classifying gapped phases of matter in 1D, that means that you can just restrict yourself to looking at matrix product states because that's, you know, that somehow there will be somehow in every phase there will be a matrix product state there and this kind of follows from the proof. Now, the equivalent problem for statistical mechanics would be if I have a transfer matrix that is gapped, can I represent the fixed point or the leading eigenvector of that transfer matrix using a matrix product state? Now, it turns out that this, not the, 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 the proofs of Hastings and all this don't kind of generalize to this case. This is a much harder kind of problem. And uh, the, uh, the conjecture is certainly that this is true, you know, this is given somehow a matrix product operator as gapped, well, that implies that somehow the fixed point will be well represented by a matrix product state. But, but there's, lots of, there's lots of technical reasons why it's much harder to solve this problem than actually the, the, the local Hamiltonian uh, problem. Although in many ways, uh, kind of a good intuitive way of looking at the matrix product operator like this is always saying, ha, there's nothing more than exponential of uh, a local Hamiltonian. This is really what, what, what and in all these cases that I showed before, and effectively this is what this thing is. And of course, if it's an exponential of a Hamiltonian with kind of, uh, um, um, with, with, with only kind of local interactions, well then of course the proof generalizes. Not because of, it's not because if you have a Hamiltonian uh, with, for which the grounds is, uh, um, um, is, is a matrix proxy, while well, the exponential of that Hamiltonian, this, this will be the leading eigenvector of that. Kind of. No, no, and that's an additional problem, of course. So even, but even if you make the assumption that this entry matrix product operator is Hermitian, even then we cannot prove anything. Basically, there's, there's, nobody has been able to, to make progress on that, and it's, it's a bit frustrating. I would think that this is the natural, uh, that this should be like that, and certainly the lots of evidence points out that it is like that because you can just use the techniques that I explained yesterday to diagonalize this, and it works. Okay, but that doesn't mean that, of course, that this is actually true. But don't you have a counter example if you consider real time evolution? So the real-time evolution operator is still the same form. No, but of course, but the real-time evolution operator is certainly not gapped, because all the eigenvalues are one in magnitude. Okay, so you have all the eigenvalues lie on the on the, on the unit circle, and uh, of course, this thing will not be will be not be gapped. No, uh, although of course there are some real-time evolution kind of things where you have indeed an an, an eigenvalue one and an, an isolated kind of point, but this is these are very special kind of things. But but this is not the counter example because of course if this thing becomes gapless then everything is open. Just like in one D, no? if if you have a Hamiltonian that is gapless, then there's no guarantee at all that actually this can be well represented using matrix product states. And there's many examples of gapless Hamiltonians in one D for which matrix product states don't work at all. These are all all these kind of constructions using NP hard kind of whatever things. Can, can actually can actually show this, but uh, but it's really on the condition that this thing is gapped, is there a matrix product state? That is, and somehow you you expect this. To, so so the intuitive reason why this should be true is that if this matrix product operator has a gap, you have the leading eigenvector and then all the rest below it. Well, you just multiply this thing a few times with each other. All the lowest, all the kind of smaller eigenvalues are suppressed exponentially, and this is of course a, 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 a matrix product state. Kind of, this is exactly what this two is. You just write a path integral instead of kind of taking infinitely many layers. If somehow you have a gap, you say, well, I just multiply this a few times, and this will be something that has a very large overlap with uh, the ground state. The problem in, in formulating this as a proof is that, of course, it could be that you have a unique kind of uh, uh, ground state that is gapped, but that somehow just above the gap, you have an exponential density of kind of excitations. 
And if there's exponentially many terms with some hard things that have a gap, that are just above the gap, then it's clear that indeed this is not kind of guaranteed to have any large overlap with the ground state. Yeah, this is, so it has to do more with, with, with somehow the, the difficulties in proving this has to do with, with somehow the density of states above the gap. And if this is exponential, then you can basically not prove anything. If it's, if it's kind of mild, if it's like a polynomial, then there could be these things will, will work out. Anyway, so uh, let's go to the uh, second section, but the second section is actually uh, um, 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 is not uh, well, indeed, I'll, I'll, I'll explain. Uh, yeah, you will see. This. <laughs> so it has to do with uh, with, uh, with normal forms and uh, and diagonalizing uh, matrix product operator. So there is some. Yeah. Sure. From the previous slide. Sorry. So do you think can, uh, we can extract all the some correlation uh, length information from these transformations? Yes. So the the, the correlation length yeah. is nothing more than the gap. Uh, of that uh, homotopy, or one over the gap of that uh, transfer matrix. I think we should be careful. So for example, if we just take the AKT state along the from, from line uh, from another direction, and then we can just form these two AKT uh, state with uh, just one dimension and extra one dimension one, like a spin zero. But we can introduce also another uh, spin one half to form this one with a maximum entanglement. But this is totally virtual um, entanglement. Yeah, I, I see. So what you say that you can you can just engineer something that has artificially lots of entanglement, but this it physically has nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so of course this I, uh, of course you can construct examples like that. But so uh, um, if you will do numerics, yeah. you will not. They will never end up with states like that, no? Because it would be very uh, very stupid to use your your kind of degrees of freedom to do something useless. Yeah, but. but um, maybe we can find the, the tensors with optimization algorithm, then how can we guarantee we can find No, well, you cannot guarantee anything. But it just, it just how, works. Then how do you conclude this correlation <laughs> length is totally physical or virtual? Well, <coughs> you can guarantee. So once you see actually what this second eigenvector is of this, okay. then you can start asking what, because somehow, this, so the excitations and so 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 again to connect with what I said yesterday. So yesterday I explained how to find ground states. This would be like the, the, the fixed point, the leading eigenvector of this. But once you have the fixed point, you also immediately have information about the, the dispersion relation, the excitation spectrum above it. And of course all of this also goes through here. So that means that using this um, this algorithm for finding excitations, this is exactly the algorithm that you need for to cal calculating the dispersion relation, for calculating the entanglement spectrum of uh, of 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 of, of, of uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, you know, maybe I'm, I'm jumping this, but I, I, anyway, I think Norbert will explain what I what I mean here uh, in his talk tomorrow. But uh, but somehow the the eigenstructure of this can be obtained by um, by some. So again, this is translation invariant. So so the the eigen eigen vectors or the excitation can be labeled by momentum and so further. And somehow, typically, the the the, the ansatz for these excitations. Uh, um, is, is again that this is like a Feynman Bile type of thing. And once you know exactly what this Feynman Bile operator is for the excitations, then you can start asking what operator do I need physically such that I would have overlap with that kind of virtual thing. So, so, so what you have is your uh, what you have is your kind of peps here. And the question is what operator do I have to put here such that kind of this thing will take your ground state to something that has overlap with your first excitation. And you know this excitation has kind of a local description because of what we said yesterday. And then you have to then you just have to find this operator. And then you know that the correlation length related to this eigenvalue structure will exactly be the, 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 the correlation length of this kind of operator. So there's really a systematic way of finding physical operators that would correspond to somehow the uh, uh, to, to somehow the eigenvectors or the, 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 the eigenstructure of this. Uh, anyway, um, let's try to understand the um, normal forms of matrix product operators. So there's something that we, uh, um, we call the fundamental uh, theorem of matrix product operators that turns out to be extremely useful. Again, it's something that is very 
in some sense simple. It's not simple to prove actually, but it's extremely powerful. Somehow we it took many years for us to appreciate that this is uh, this is something that uh, um, that is so uh, powerful. Anyway, so again, this is the definition of a matrix product operator. It's just the same definition as I uh, <coughs> gave uh, before. And now there's an extremely important concept of injectivity that probably um, you have already heard also in. Uh, previous talk. So what does this mean, injectivity? No, no, this is the first time we... Oh, nobody has talked about injectivity? Right. I just mentioned that you will go to for a disclosure. Okay, well, okay. But anyway, so um, it's, uh, it's very simple. Okay, there's nothing deep to injectivity. It just means that if you write down, you just take out uh, 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 some part of this whole matrix board operator, just take out some stretch of tensors. And you consider this to be a map, a matrix from the blue indices to the red indices. So in this case, you have eight blue indices and two red indices. Well, this is nothing more than a matrix. Okay? It's a matrix from the blue to the red ones. It's a rectangular matrix. And your system is injective if and only if this matrix is full rank. That's just what it means. So it means that basically that for every kind of vert operator that you put on the virtual level, there is actually um, you can, or to, for every degree of freedom on the virtual level, you can access it by putting operators or, or, or some kind of operators on the physical level. Okay, so that, so and again, injectivity is nothing more. Take, of course, in the case of matrix product states, uh, you also have the same notion. You just don't have this upper indices. It's just the same. That somehow the mapping from the physical indices to the virtual ones, if you kind of put a few of them next to each other, is full rank. And of course, why do we have to block a few of them? Because typically this red indices, this is the virtual bond dimension, is much, much larger than the physical degree of freedom. And of course, this thing you want to block. So, so this, the dimension of this matrix, of the, of the, of the, of the, the, the blue dimension of your matrix kind of increases exponentially with the number of blocks that you put next to each other. And uh, while this kind of red thing doesn't change, of course, by, by blocking. So you have to kind of make sure that uh, you put enough next to each other such that this whole thing is... Uh, um, is, is that the blue dimension is larger than the red dimension, and then you're injective if and only if um, 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 this matrix is full length. What is yeah. in box up there? Uh, where is number, number of boxes? Yeah. There exists box a finite yeah. n, and n would be 4 here. Okay. Um, it's actually not easy to find. So, so, so there is something that is called a Wieland here. So there's something very similar known in, in classical stochastic processes. Okay, so what is the analog of this notion in classical stochastic processes? Is that if you have a stochastic matrix that is, um, uh, what's the technical term? Um, um, sorry? Primitive. So if you have a stochastic matrix that is primitive, it means that you, you it's, it's the kind of basically a ergodicity that, that starting from an arbitrary sample that there is a way from going from this one sample to all the possible other samples. Well then, it means that if you have this stochastic matrix and you put this, that there is a, a power n, such so that s to the n is basically a matrix with all non-zero entries. Okay, and this n is very similar basically to this n. What is the, the power of this kind of thing that you have to do, such as to get, and so forth, and so forth. And this is, this is very, very much related to this. So this is like a, a quantum version of, of, of primitivity. Um, anyway, what is the fundamental theorem? And this is... It's called fundamental, because, so this is the, 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 the baby version of it, and the next slide I will give you the real version, but somehow this is really the thing, the, the, the technical tool you need to understand if you want to classify topological phase of matter in 2D using somehow these, uh, these uh, perhaps algorithms. Anyway, so what is this fundamental theorem of uh, uh, injective matrix product state? It means that somehow two matrix product operators are equal to each other if and only if there exists a gauge transform which transforms AIJ into BIJ. Okay, so I give you two matrix product operators, A and B, with the kind of matrices A and B. Well, these kind of MPOs are equal to each other if and only if somehow the local description is equal up to a gauge transform. Okay, so this is uh, uh, effectively. So, so again, I cannot believe that injectivity has not kind of been brought up because this is exactly what you need uh, to prove uh, uh, the, uh, the, the technical tool that you need for kind of working with this... Uh, um, um, for, for understanding the symmetries of matrix blocks, it's just as I will show. So, so the first, let, let me indeed show you the first application of this. Okay? And this has been shown, so in some sense, people must have talked about implicitly about injectivity. So, if this MPS is injective, then this implies that if you have a global symmetry on your system, then somehow this is implemented on a virtual level 
by somehow uh, in, a, in a projective way. Okay, and this is this is what you need. You need injectivity to be able to prove this. Okay, so this is only true if your uh, um, if your system is injective. Actually, the proof of this is uh, is just uh, Cauchy Schwarz. Okay, you just have to do uh, uh, Cauchy Schwarz in a smart way, and it can be a deep proof. This kind of fact that. Okay, because again, what is the what the, 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 the difficult? I mean, the non-trivial thing is this now, of course, that if two matrix product states or matrix product operators are equal to each other, this implies so, and of course, this has to be for all possible lengths n. Then this implies that these kind of things uh, are locally equivalent up to a gauge transform. Well, that's exactly that. If you say if your my MPS is invariant under global symmetry, that means that if I apply the same U to all my kind of physical levels. Means that this guy is equal to the original one. Well, this means that this thing must be uh, this matrix. This is the B must be equal to the A up to a gauge transform. Yes. So in the previous style, you have to have n equal to four. So suppose you have an injective that yeah, requires n equal to four. Then can you do this transformation at uh, one? Yes. NPL? Yes. So it just have to, there has to be a finite n such that it becomes injective. Uh -huh. Then it is true on the single level. You don't have to block this thing to be true. So indeed, this is a good question. Um, anyway, this is, this is exactly the tool that you need to, to classify somehow the, the 1D symmetry uh, protected phases, like explained by, uh, by Frank and, uh, of course, I think, well, many, many of the people actually are in the audience here. But, uh, but that was also kind of formalized uh, by Chen, Gu Wen, and then Norbert, uh, David, and uh, Ignacio, and uh, actually many other uh, people. Anyway, so, but the, the more... Uh, um, the, the more advanced version of this is actually what happens if your MPO is non-injective. Okay, so, so what is the version, so what is this fundamental theorem in the case of non-injective MPOs? And that's what you need to, that's, the, that's exactly the tool that we will need later. And you will see that actually the, this is exactly the, 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 the thing you need to understand, let's say, the, the young box equations of integrability and all this in terms of matrix product operators, you will exactly need exactly this, this thing. So what if an, so if an MPO is non-injective, okay? Um, um, somehow the first thing that we really need to realize is that there already exists a base in which the MPS is upper block diagonal. Okay, so this was actually also mentioned by uh, by Frank I think yesterday or the day before. But uh, so it means that if you're not injective, you can always write your MPS or MPO in this form. Okay, so you can basically there exists a unit transformation that that kind of identifies the invariant subspaces such so that this is upper block triangular. Okay. And um, the kind of thing that is clear is that this thing has no meaning whatsoever. Okay? Because if you do the trace of matrices of that kind, because that's how the MPO or the MPS is defined by just taking traces of, upper, of these upper triangular matrices, this thing will never occur. Okay? Because you take all these MPSs with each other and you take the trace, you can immediately see that somehow if you multiply matrices like this with each other, this block kind of this, the, the, this influence of this A12 will only be kind of in this upper triangle block. And if you take a trace of this, you cannot see this. Okay, and that's why somehow this theorem is actually pretty much, it's really much more complicated. Okay, the, 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 the kind of, 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 of fundamental theorem uh, in, uh, um, um, for non-injective maps. So, so what you see is that this block doesn't contribute. Um, and therefore you can equal, you can put it equal to zero. Okay, and that's somehow what the fundamental theorem of MPS or MPOs is, is that two matrix product states are equal to each other for all kind of n, if and only if the injective MPS, because this now have the potential of being injective MPS. So if this, so, so what you see is if this, I start with an MPO, okay, and I can then find the unit transformation that identifies the invariant subspaces, then I get somehow two kind of matrix product states. Either these things are now injective, or somehow these things can again not be injective, if they're not injective, you have again to kind of do such a block triangular decomposition of these kind of things. And at the end, what you can prove is that two MPOs or MPSs are equal to each other for all n, if and only if the injective decomposition. So at the end, what you will get is a diagonal kind of a block diagonal kind of description of your matrix product operator. And somehow, if somehow the, the diagonal injective blocks are equal to each other. Yes? But doesn't this very much depend on the boundary conditions that you have? I mean, this only vanishes if you take the trace, if you pick open boundary conditions with some boundary vectors and you sure have a contribution of this upper... Well, no, of course, if you take different boundary conditions, that's not true. But um, um, it turns out that this is the right... Uh, so, so certainly for, for the applications that we have in mind, this is actually the right thing. So, so these matrix product operators will typically, well, as we'll see later, will, for example, be Wilson loops 
and your apps. Okay, and there obviously they kind of are closed by uh, a trace. Okay, and many and, and, and just in practice this is actually a, the, this is the notion that you want. But I agree if you put this M this M matrix that I had like in this I don't know exactly where. So if you put this M that such that it has overlap with this off diagonal block, then this is not true anymore. Okay, that's just clear. Um, anyway, so this is the fundamental theorem. Okay, this is the, the kind of, it's not entirely obvious to, 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 to prove this, but I, can, I think the idea is clear. No? So two MPSs are equal to each other if and only if the block diagonal kind of uh, injected, the injective block diagonal, the injective blocks that you get by doing something iteratively, whatever, um, uh, are equal to each other. So, so let me give an example of matrix block operators where this thing uh, is actually relevant. And this is, I think, uh, um, um, very relevant in uh, the context of, of you know, immediately see that it's relevant in this context of, of, of SPT phases and classifying two-dimensional uh, uh, SPT phases. So, so there's this very uh, nice paper of, of Chang and Wen where they basically introduced uh, somehow the, 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 the spin, quantum spin versions of SPT phases in two dimensions. And they, uh, I don't know whether anybody talked about this already in the, uh, during the, the, the lecture. This is somehow, there's some, well, this is this SPT phase uh, with the non-trivial kind of edge modes. Um, and in, uh, uh, in 2D. Anyway, so the, the, the whole physics of uh, this paper is um, obtained by looking at uh, a basically a special matrix product operator and kind of proving that if you have uh, a Hamiltonian uh, that has the symmetry of this matrix product operator, that it cannot have a unique kind of ground state uh, that is a matrix product state. So either somehow the, 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 the so if you have a, a if you have a Hamiltonian with a symmetry that is kind of given by a matrix product operator, it means that somehow this this basically commutes with your Hamiltonian. Then um, um, then then what uh, what was proven in this paper is that somehow this uh, this uh, the, the the ground state cannot be uh, um, um, a matrix product state and therefore cannot be somehow unique ground state of a gap Hamiltonian. Okay, that means that indeed there must be some kind of a, a non-trivial uh, edge modes. But anyway, so what all this physics, so, so how do you prove this? Is really by looking at the eigen, somehow the normal forms of this, uh, of this, this matrix product operators. So, um, and, uh, but here somehow this is not what I want to explain. So what I want to just, I would just like to use this to show that this normal form is actually non-trivial. So this is obviously somehow this is um, um, uh, a matrix product operator with one dimension two. Okay, what you have is basically a product of all sigma x, uh, things and then these yellow boxes are nothing more than C naught gates. Okay, so this is a diagonal gate one 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 minus one that is entangling a lot. That's why somehow the bond dimension of this matrix product operator is two. Um, and uh, now uh, it happens that actually the square of this matrix product operator is equal to the identity. Okay, so up to so it's minus one to the n times the identity with n the number of spins that you would have if you close kind of this thing. Okay, and that means that actually this must be a, so, so this fundamental theorem must have a very non-trivial kind of implementation here, no? Because I take a matrix product operator with bond dimension two, if I multiply it with itself, I obviously get something with bond dimension four. And how can I kind of now use, kind of see that indeed this is equal to the identity? Okay, so this is actually not obvious, and so what you have to do is basically take the tensor product, so this is the, the bond dimension four kind of version of somehow this, this CZX, this MPO squared, something with one dimension for it. turns out that these are the two matrices that you kind of obtain. And, um, <coughs> and now um, you have to basically diagonalize. You have to use this kind of algorithm that I uh, explained here before. This is, turns out to have invariant subspace, so you have to find a U such that these two matrices can be written in this upper triangular form. And then you will see that somehow if you do this, there will indeed be some an of diagonal form in this upper block. You have to make it equal to zero, then you end up with two blocks. And it turns out these two blocks themselves are also not injective, so you have to kind of repeat this another time. And at the end you see that indeed this thing is completely equal to the identity. Okay, so this is this shows you that it's actually not obvious. No? So the, this, this whole construction with this off diagonal blocks is very important to have this and to be able to, 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 to realize that somehow these uh, uh, these obvious diagonal blocks, this is not something pathological, this is really something that happens there and it's very important that you put it uh, uh, equal to zero. Otherwise you cannot understand somehow the, the structure or the eigenstructure of this. Uh, uh, excuse me. What yes? happens if we apply the singular value decomposition to reduce the, I mean, to, to make the uh, low rank matrix uh, approximation to this? Oh no, of course the singular value decomposition will show you this. Okay. Okay, but this is just the, 
it's just the technical, this is the proof, no? that this is equal to here, if and only if there's, a, and, and it's just no, it's, it's important to, to know that there's self diagonal blocks, so this is actually not, the linear algebra is actually not easy to, to do, because I'm not finding invariant subspaces of, uh, of operators is actually something that is hard. This is not, there's no good kind of linear algebra algorithms of this, but of course, if you take, look at this thing as a matrix product state, and you just take the, kind of try to reduce the bond dimension by uh, a standard kind of NPS techniques, you will find that this is equal to the identity. Okay. But somehow the reason of this is exactly that there are these invariant subspaces. But, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, I was confused about basic things. So, so this, since the model is two-dimensional model, and this is MPO uh, Hamiltonian written as MPO? No, no, this is actually, this turns out to, to, um, to, to represent the symmetries of the edge of your two dimensions. So you have a two dimensional theory, mm -hmm. turns out to be a PEPS, mm -hmm. and you can see that actually the edge, the, the, the entanglement degrees of freedom that live outside of your kind of thing uh, are invariant by multiplying with this matrix problem. So it's something that actually characterizes the symmetry of your, uh, of, of your system. Symmetry for Indeed, indeed. And it shows that okay. if you have this symmetry that somehow, uh, that, that if you have a Hamiltonian that has the symmetry, that's what they prove, it cannot be basically uh, a gapped uh, system with unique ground state. And that's actually the technical proof that they need. Okay, and this is of course all related to, to somehow what, what, what they said. Somehow, this is just an example to show that, that is what the normal form does. Okay, so that, that, that's the reason that I, I, I wanted to kind of talk about this. Okay, so, uh, um, well, yeah, okay, I don't really want to talk about this. This is about the question, how do we diagnose? matrix product operators, okay, so uh, uh, you give him this MPO, actually this is exactly what I explained yesterday, no? so give him an MPO, how to find leading eigenvectors of a matrix product operator, that's exactly this whole TDVP business, or there's many variants, or IDMRG, or uh, whatever, there's many, there's many kind of, you can use corner transfer matrices, there's many, many, many ways of, uh, um, of doing this, so this is not the topic of uh, this talk. Okay, so let me go to the third part, uh, because actually everything that I said till now was kind of working towards this uh, um, this part. Uh, and let me kind of um, try to um, um, uh, convey that, that the algebraic structures in these matrix product operators are actually very, very relevant and very interesting object to study. Okay, so let me, uh, I'm not so sure to what extent people are familiar uh, with, uh, with the beta ansatz, um, but somehow it turns out that this fits extremely well in this whole kind of, 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 of matrix product operator way of looking at uh, so what is the central concept in the technical model of statistical physics and also in kind of uh, quantum spin chains? It happens that somehow the, 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 the central kind of, 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 uh, um, of tool, technical tool that you need to understand the integral systems is to find um, matrix product operators that depend on one parameter, a continuous parameter, in such a way that they commute independent of what this parameter is. Okay, so you want to find one parameter families of matrix product operators that commute. Okay, so that's the algebraic kind of relation that you need. You say, I want to find MPOs that depend on lambda and mu, so that for all values of lambda and mu, um, they commute. That turns out to be the key ingredient that you need for kind of coming up with integrable uh, systems. Okay, so, so let's apply the fundamental theorem of matrix product operators to this, okay? because this is exactly, this is made for this. No? It tells you if t lambda times t mu is t mu times t lambda, it means that somehow this MPO here that I have with lambda and mu must be equal to the MPO where the fundamental somehow the B matrix is mu lambda. So that means that there must exist a gauge transform that transforms lambda mu to mu lambda. Okay, so what you want to do is now to find basically what are the conditions uh, on these tensors such that I can find such solutions. Okay, so what, how can I kind of construct matrix product operators such that they satisfy this condition? And the whole fundamental idea of the algebraic beta ansatz is actually to turn this into a completely different problem now, namely saying, look, if indeed lambda and mu is equal to mu lambda, then there must exist a gauge transform that transforms this thing to this thing. This is exactly the fundamental theorem. Um, now, um, what you can see is that somehow if this condition is true, if there exist R matrices that transform lambda mu into mu lambda, then these R matrices must satisfy some associativity conditions. And that's exactly how you will construct at the end. So, so now you, you turn this problem into somehow a problem and find what are the conditions on R such that somehow something like this is possible. And the associativity conditions for this kind of R matrices are exactly kind of known as the Young-Bastard equations. 
Okay, and so this reduces now to find something like what are the solutions of these young Baxter equations, and then given these solutions, you will be able to kind of find some, uh, or, or, or that, that there's many, many MPOs at the end that will satisfy this for a given R. But somehow the, the crucial thing in the beta ansatz is to turn basically this, um, this problem of finding commuting sets of matrix product operators to somehow finding what are the conditions that these R matrices have to satisfy. And it's very, sim it's very simple to see that indeed that these R matrices must, must, must satisfy some associativity conditions. Because, so what is this, uh, so why do you get associativity? Namely, you have MPOs, they commute with each other. Okay, so let's say this is lambda mu. Well, if I take three of them, okay, and multiply three matrix product operators with each other, lambda mu and mu, obviously there's kind of um, um, two different ways in which kind of I can reorder these indices. I can first kind of switch these ones, and then somehow these ones, or I can first switch these ones and these ones. If you write this out, you see that actually this implies that this, these two ways, of course, because of the fundamental theorem, must be equivalent, because it must be kind of be related to a gauge transform. That means that actually these R matrices, these gauge transforms, must satisfy this kind of relations. And this is what is known as the um, as, as the young master relation. So you see, this is just an immediate consequence of this fundamental theorem of matrix product operators that if the two MPOs are equal to each other, there must exist a gauge transform. Well, this gauge transform must, must satisfy some trivial associativity conditions. And of course, what is not trivial, and this is what mathematical statisticians have been proven, is that this is the only condition you need. This is the only condition that these R matrices have. And therefore, if you find somehow an algebraic solution of this set of equations, then actually you will be able to find matrix product operators that satisfy this kind of thing. Well, it turns out that if you kind of look carefully at this equation, lambda mu mu lambda times r, and you kind of kind of just kind of make these indices like look in a different way, you can immediately see that by choosing lambda, this tensor lambda and mu itself as an R matrix, this equation is completely equivalent to this equation. And that's called the fundamental kind of solution of somehow the, or the fundamental representation of your young Baxter equations basically by taking then your matrix product operator itself being given by these R matrices. But of course, there's many other kind of solutions that you can take. So what I want to do later is actually I want to show you that all this classification of topological orders in, uh, in 2D uh, spin systems is kind of somehow the, 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 is an analog of what happens here in this beta ansatz. Okay, so, so it's, it's really, uh, you kind of come up with an algebra of matrix product operators. In this case, you say they have to commute. You immediately kind of end up with the fact that there must exist R matrices that satisfy some associativity. You find solutions of this algebraic equation. This is exactly finding all possible integrable models. And then you can construct models that actually have this uh, same thing. Yes? But on these T matrices, or the, the MPOs for the T matrices in the algebraic of that, that's not injected by construction. No, actually, uh, I was I was wrong what I said before. Actually, in this case, they are all injective. They're not injective. They're injective. They're injective. They're injective. Okay, so let me let me kind of explain this. Uh, like, let, let, let's just do it. Okay, so so for the people, so I I, I guess so that many people in the audience have never really studied these algebraic ends, right? Also, but it's very it's very kind of intuitive from the from the matrix product state point of view. So uh, so let's kind of take bond dimension two, uh, and. Uh, um, it's very simple to kind of construct solutions of these scan bus equations. No? So if you take bond dimension two, well then these R matrices they obviously have like they are they are two by two by two by two tensors, they're MPOs. You can kind of reshape it as a four by four matrix. Okay, because this there's, there's 16 elements there. And what you can see is that actually in this particular case, all the young Buster uh, solutions are certainly, certainly the simplest kind of solutions of this form. Okay, you find kind of uh, some functions f and g, and these are typically algebraic functions or kind of involving sine hyperbolic and all these kind of things. Anyway, so the young Buster equations that we had, okay, so, so you find this satisfied the young Buster equation, then you construct basically this, uh, this MPO out of it, and then you can immediately, it's actually, it looks it looks very complicated, but it's actually not very complicated. You can immediately see that this young Baxter equation kind of implies that somehow these different uh, operators or these different kind of uh, uh, blocks have to kind of satisfy this. So, so again, no, I didn't explain actually very well. So we take this transfer <laughs> matrix, okay, corresponding to somehow this R matrix, where you take this transfer matrix itself kind of satisfying this young Baxter equation. And then if you close this kind of thing, there's different ways in which you can close it. Okay, if you kind of take the trace, this would be just putting the identity here. But somehow it turns out that you can construct now four different matrix product operators. Okay, you can construct one where you put the one zero zero zero. I call this A. The B is somehow the zero one zero zero and so forth. So there's four different MPOs that you can construct. It turns out that, for example, the one that uh, that you have here with B will kind of be somehow effectively um, a creation operator. Okay, this will kind of create kind of particles in your beta ansatz. But anyway, so, so you get four of these MPOs, 
and using somehow the, the, the young Baxter relations, you can immediately deduce somehow the commutation relations for all these matrix point operators. And I show this because that's the essence of the belt algebraic beta ansatz. No? You, you kind of come up with an algebra of your matrix point operators. Okay? And these four oper matrix point operators satisfy this kind of algebra. So the important kind of part for us is actually only the first two lines. These are the ones that we, uh, uh, we care about. So you see that actually all these B matrices commute, the C matrices commute, and actually the A and the B, they have this kind of algebraic relation that looks like this. A times B is equal to B times A plus F and G and so forth. And then you kind of find consistency equations for this, and this gives rise to this better equation. So it turns out that once you find this, you find, you just solve this, you can see that um, all the eigenstates of your Hamiltonian or of this matrix product operator. Okay, this is actually the way you solve these these models that I talked about before, right? in the beginning of the talk, like this six vertex model and so forth, this is exactly how you can solve them. You can see that actually the eigenvectors of all of this form. You take products of these matrix product operators acting on somehow a product state. So this product state would just be all spins up. And then you take products of matrix product operators, okay, this is that all commute with each other, and this will be the exact eigenstate of your uh, kind of thing. So in particular, kind of for the for the problem of spin eyes, although I'm, uh, yeah, it turns out that actually this, this matrix product operator is of this form, it's like lambda times the identity plus somehow some, uh, some swap operator. Um, and um, for the Heisenberg anti for a magnet, it turns out, so how, how do you make the connection? Because this is all about matrix product operators and the question of Heisenberg, how do you make the connection with, with integrable systems of quantum system? Well, it turns out that if you have these MPOs, of course, this is like, as I said before, it's like you can interpret this effectively as an exponential of a Hamiltonian. So if you take the logarithmic derivative of these MPOs with respect to this parameter and all these kind of guys commute, therefore it doesn't, there's no problem whatsoever in taking a derivative because all these upper matrix product operators commute with each other. If you take this logarithmic derivative and put at the end lambda equal to zero, this is exactly the Heisenberg law, the Heisenberg anti magnet. And that's how you kind of connect statistical physics with, uh, uh, with uh, all these things. But anyway, so what is the... Uh, yes? Can you go back one, two slides, probably? So again, how do you... How do you Decide that R is this form. Ah, but this this is a set of solutions, given that it's F and G are of course special functions of the Young-Baxter equations. Okay. So that's so so what is the so again so what is the logic here? So we say I want to impose algebraic relations among a one-parameter family of matrix product operators. Okay, the fact that this has to be equal to this. I want this. That means that there must exist a gauge transform that transforms the mu lambda or lambda mu into mu lambda. That's the fundamental theorem of matrix product states. Now, if there exists such an R matrix that satisfies this, these R matrices themselves must satisfy the associativity conditions. Otherwise, it cannot be. This is just a consistency equation. And it turns out that this is the only consistency equation that you have to impose on these R matrices. So what you do then is find solutions of these R matrices. And using the solution of the R matrix, then you can actually find solutions for these matrix product operators themselves. Okay, and, and, that's, and that's exactly the logic that we also want to take now for constructing topological states of matter with EPS. Okay, so what we will see is that I want to impose some kind of an algebraic structure on some matrix product operators. Then you will see that there will, some there will be some associativity conditions there. And these associativity conditions, I can find the unique solution. These will be the pentagon equations that are very kind of well known in this whole kind of uh, 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 theory of, of topological uh, order, and then given somehow this 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 kind of R, this will be the analog of these R matrices. I can then construct somehow a fundamental representation of a theory that lives in that kind of universality class by making these kind of things, choosing these things equal to the R. But of course, there's many other choices. And this is important to know here. So this is just one possible choice, of course, to take this kind of tensors here equal to basically this R matrix, but there's many other choices that you can make. Okay, this is this is this turns out to kind of give you the, the whole kind of, of, of construction of all these string nets that uh, Levin and Wen have been uh, kind of talking about. And that's actually what I want to uh, to work towards. So A B C D are So A, B, C and D are matrix prompt operators. And the, the only difference is the boundary condition. How do you close the MPO? Okay, so, so they, are, they are two to the n by two to the n matrices, A, B, C, and D. So, so <coughs> A, B, C, D corresponds to this Indeed. entire MPO. It's the entire with MPO with, uh, with a different boundary condition. And that's how you construct basically f four different MPOs here. Mm -hmm. 
and you can easily, it's, it's actually very straightforward to see that the young box implies these algebraic relations of the MPOs. Ah, this is so. So actually, this is the t. Oh, this is t. Yeah, the, the t. you will choose t equal to r, basically. Okay, okay but this is a, of course you have to kind of label the things right. No, this is like this is like an i j alpha beta. Okay, and this is about, as we shaped as a four by four matrix. But this is t itself. This is the fundamental representation. But this is well done. That, that if you have you find r matrices, then you have to construct t matrix. You have to find models that actually have these r matrices. But there's many different choices. So that's how you kind of construct this higher spin, like in the, in the case of integral models, you can have a spin one half integral, but you can also construct spin one integral models. And this is basically by taking, choosing different, so the R matrices are the same as for the spin one half, but somehow the T matrices are kind of basically tensor products, and then you kind of make somehow irreducible representation of these things, and that's how you kind of construct these whole towers of integrable models, with actually starting from the same R matrix. But this is only one choice, and it turns out that indeed, in the case of these string nets, okay, for topological order, this is exactly somehow the string nets will be this fundamental representation of this thing. But again, there's many other ways of constructing theories that will have the same topological order but with, with different kind of dimensions. Okay, so uh, so we are uh, halfway in the talk. <laughs> okay, I will have to speed up. Um, let's try to um, um, understand how these matrix both operator algebras can arise in the context of topological ordered systems. Okay, so uh, it turns out that the young baxter relations that we had, um, that there is a way, so, so, so the, the thing that is not natural from the point of view of topological order is that these young baxter relations have a continuous parameter. Okay, so I have an algebra somehow, but uh, there's this continuous parameter in this, uh, in this matrix both operators that is, that is fine. Now it turns out that there is kind of a way of, of course, making sure that these things compute for all lambdas and mu's, if you kind of go back to here. If you kind of take both lambda and mu going to infinity, then this thing is automatically satisfied for all kind of, kind of things. Anyway, this matrix both up, these are the relations that you will get are exactly somehow the, 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 the construction or some of the framework in which you kind of need to start thinking about quantum groups. And I think everybody in Japan is extremely familiar with all this quantum group kind of things. <laughs> because, uh, because of Jimbo and, uh, and anyway, this is like the, the place where, where everything uh, happens. No? So, so that's why I don't have to explain anything of this. Uh, anyway, this is what we will do. Okay? So, so in some sense, the, the, um, the, somehow there's a limiting kind of case in which you can get rid of these parameters lambda and mu, these spectral parameters. And this is exactly somehow the limit in which you get all these integrable uh, uh, models. Okay, so, uh, um, and this is exactly what this, 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 this will solve. So, so, so um, what we will do is basically construct algebras of matrix product operators that will characterize somehow the, 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 the topological features of your theory. Maybe it will kind of, and in some sense what we want to do is to write down algebra of matrix product operators that correspond to the Wilson loops in your kind of topological theories. Okay, it turns out that this is exactly, so that's actually what we do. Okay, we will construct matrix product operators with some non-trivial algebraic features and they will kind of encode all somehow the, ex, the, the, the somehow the features or somehow the, 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 the algebra, uh, the, the, let's say the, the way to construct anions and all this will be completely encoded in the way uh, that these matrix product operators uh, look, that, look, look, look like. And um, it turns out that this is exactly what people call tensor fusion category. I don't, so again, I myself, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not familiar at all with, with somehow the mathematical literature, but it turns out that actually this whole matrix product operator formalism together with this fundamental theorem, allows you to derive many, many of the results that are known there in a very straightforward way. Okay, so, uh, but before I do this, let me kind of briefly explain what, uh, uh, what this has to do with pairs, because at the end, this is what we will do. We will kind of construct uh, projected entangled pair states that have actually some non-trivial topological order. And the whole idea uh, is actually that these matrix product operators encode some kind of Wilson loops of your theory. Or in another way, they encode somehow the symmetries of your uh, MPO. So anyway, so um, what you probably all have seen is that uh, if you have a system with topological order, um, that um, the um, entanglement entropy somehow of this uh, block has some kind of quantum. So probably I have to take a walk here. But uh, anyway, uh, 
So this is a mistake, but somehow that there's a there's a correction, there's a correction to the entanglement entropy. So if you take a block of spins, this is a PEPS, and you take somehow this block of spins and calculate the entanglement entropy, the scale is like the boundary of this kind of, um, uh, the size of the boundary uh, of this block, but minus a constant. And this minus the constant exactly tells you that this block is not injective. Namely that all this kind of states, the mapping from the physical to the virtual level here, namely these links that are sticking out, is not injective. Namely that the rank is not like equal to the dimension of the space on the outside, but it's dimension minus something else. So that means that actually the PEPs that are, th this will tu this turn out to be the crucial kind of, of uh, ingredient to understand kind of topological order in this, in this PEPs, namely that you need some symmetries, okay, so that, that somehow topological order will be characterized by some symmetries of some higher entanglement degrees of freedom. Okay, and that's exactly, if this indeed, the virtual levels lives in a subspace of your full space, namely it must have a certain symmetry, that's exactly what this quantum correction is to the entanglement entropy. Okay, so let's kind of make this a little bit more explicit. So you take this kind of PEPs picture, well, it turns out that topological order will kind of be represented by some how matrix product operators that characterize the symmetry. Maybe that you take this block, put this MPO around it, well, it turns out that this whole block must be equal to this. Okay, this is actually, this is a symmetry and therefore this can, cannot be full rank. That's what the correction to the entanglement entropy kind of will uh, give you. It turns out that if you have this feature, then you can, well, start using all this theorems of matrix product states of PEPs and so further. Anyway, so what turns out is that this symmetry, having this symmetry, locally means that there exists something like a matrix product operator that can be pulled through your kind of um, um, tensor. So if you have this kind of PEPs that exist, an MPO, so this is like a part of this MPO that you can basically pull through your um, um, uh, to, to your tensor, that somehow this is the symmetry. That, and that's of course well, exactly the feature that you want from a Wilson loop. Now we start with some Wilson loop, but the, where this loop is is completely irrelevant. Now this exactly, this, 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 this kind of rule will tell you that indeed you can take this and deform it, and at the end you can contract this to a, to a point. So this is the local way of encoding somehow the symmetries. And turns out that actually this is exactly, now you can start looking, aha, what are the consistency equations or the consistency conditions that these matrix product operators have to satisfy such that they cannot indeed can represent such uh, um, uh, a symmetry. So, so maybe this all looks a bit abstract, so let me give an example that probably most of you know, and this is this, uh, this so-called toy code. Okay, so, uh, turns out that the, the, the symmetry that we have in this particular case is actually very simple. The, 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 the symmetry of your, of, your, um, 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 of your virtual dimensions, of your virtual subspace, is nothing more than identity plus e to the n. It means that actually the, the parity of all the spins that stick out of this PEPS description has to be even. That's nothing more. That's of course, this means that actually this matrix product operator is, is, is such one half times the identity plus e to the tensor n. And uh, so what is crucial here is to see is that this matrix product operator is actually not injective. Okay? Because it's a sum of two injective matrix product operators with bond dimension one. Okay, so but but and this so that's why somehow you already see that ah, I will that you will need the fundamental theorem. No? You will need this kind of Given the symmetries that are characterized by a matrix product operator, you will now want to bring this in somehow to its block diagonal normal form, and then look basically at the algebra of these kind of things. Okay, so so anyway, so uh, so this is exactly what uh, what happens. So we will well, we will construct somehow. There's a systematic way of constructing now PEPSs that will have some certain symmetries. Given somehow these MPOs, then you can construct PEPSs that correspond to this fundamental representation. But I don't I don't really want to uh, go too much into detail there. Somehow the, the details can be found in this, uh, actually in this, uh, in this paper. So let's kind of go through the same um, logic as was used in the beta ansatz. No? So the whole idea is that I'm not uh, somehow interested immediately in my PEPs itself. I'm rather interested in somehow this, uh, um, this, this matrix product operator that characterizes the symmetry of my matrix of, of, of my PEPs, okay, because somehow, and I'm interested in the, co this, is, this is actually the analog of this R matrix, okay, this R matrix, because this is like an MPO constructed by these R matrix. And what, so the question is now, what are the conditions that these red, this matrix product operators that characterize the symmetry have to satisfy? Okay, so, uh, well, the first thing is that we know is it has to be a projector, okay, so P squared is equal to P, okay, so that means, with the fundamental theorem, that somehow, that if, if I take the product of these two, well, they, they are equal to each other. That means that if, if I take this MPO, multiply it by itself, this has to be brought in normal form in such a way that this is equal to the original one. Okay, and this actually means nothing else that if I take an MPO and multiply it with another MPO, 
somehow this, that, that, that somehow the square of these kind of things, this is PL squared, this, is a linear combination of the original ones. Okay? Because that's exactly what this tells you. Know? P squared is equal to P. It means that actually this thing, which is a sum of block diagonal MPOs, if I take the square of this, it has to be equal to itself. That means that actually uh, the MPOs, the injective parts of your MPOs themselves must satisfy some kind of non-trivial relation. And you already immediately see here that this will lead to fusion. No? So I have an MPO, I multiply with another MPO, well this must be a linear combination of the MPOs itself. Okay? This is basically the, the, the so how we want to find solutions to this. Uh, uh, to, we want to really to find MPOs that satisfy this condition. And indeed somehow all these N things have to satisfy some relations. And this is exactly kind of the business that people in that's the fusion categories kind of uh, deal uh, with. Anyway, so the fundamental theorem of matrix Planck state tells you that this P squared must have the same blocks as P. Okay, this is so there must exist a gauge transform. Okay, so given an MPO and another one, there must exist a gauge transform such that this thing is equal to the original one. That's exactly what the fundamental theorem tells you. And now what we will do is actually try to find what the consistency equations are for these X matrices. Okay, because if indeed there exists a gauge transform that transforms this to this, now I will be able to use somehow. Again, associativity, namely if I have three of these blocks, there's two different ways in which there exist gauge transforms that will map this to the original one, and these are exactly kind of given by these equations. So notice that the, the whole structure here is a bit different than what we had in the beta ansatz. In the beta ansatz, the unboxed equations, we always had the same number of output lines as input lines. Here we don't have this. We, the number of lines in the middle is much larger than the lines in the outside. But anyway, for the rest, it's a very similar algebraic structure. And associativity conditions for these kind of, 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 of matrices <coughs> implies that this has to be equal to this, which implies that somehow these x matrices must satisfy some kind of a non-trivial equation. Okay, and this, this looks maybe complicated, but it's actually very natural in the case of matrix product Do these have to be projectors? That's what I impose. Okay, that's that's kind of my algebra that I kind of impose. So, like, what did you do in the beta ansatz? You said I want to find uh, a commuting sets of uh, MPOs with a one-parameter family of commuting MPOs. Well, here I say, let me kind of now say I want to find um, MPOs um, um, that form an, that somehow I want to characterize all MPOs that square to themselves. Let's try to find out what somehow what algebraic structure comes out of this condition. And that's what we are doing. You know? It's just saying, if I have an MPO that is basically a projector independent of the number of kind of sites, then it implies that somehow this structure must be there, and it, must, it means that there must exist matrices X that satisfy this relation with some kind of F matrix. And of course, it's not a coincidence that they call this F. This is exactly somehow these F symbols that you will see to have. Anyway, now, once you have this equation, you can say, ah, there must, there must exist some F matrix, some, some, some linear, they are just coefficients that for which this x is satisfied is now you can do another time the same associativity because if I know that x times x is equal to this time then you can take kind of three of these x's and I can reorder it in two different ways and again associativity will imply some condition on these f matrices and this is exactly the pentagon equation that is very famous in the theory of uh, uh, of tensor modular categories yes so these projectors do they act they actually project onto this accessible subspace yes subspace. they exactly characterize <laughs> The, the symmetry on which your virtual degrees or your entanglement degrees of freedom live. That's what they do. Okay, and this equation turns out to have been studied enormously by mathematicians, and they have been able to characterize basically all different solutions of that. Okay, and this is exactly this pentagon equation, and this is exactly what people use to classify topological phases of matter. So you see, these things come kind of out very naturally. What we did, the only thing we did here is use the fundamental theorem of matrix product operators where it's been starting from the from the given fact that I want to characterize MPOs that are projectors. That's the only input that you had. Anyway, so what you find, so it turns out that there's only a finite number of solutions of this. So given somehow the dimension, because of course there's all these indices, but they are like running for a certain dimension. If you fix these dimensions, there's only a finite number of solutions of these equations, just like there's only a finite, you can classify all the solutions of the young equation, equations, or you can classify the equation solution of this. And um, so once you have these solutions, you can now construct pepsis, just given these kind of solutions, these are the symmetries, well, you can now easily construct, once you have the symmetry, you can easily construct one example of a peps that has the symmetry, namely, take this MPO itself, close it like this, so you just basically take the MPO that has the symmetries, 
close it like this and as kind of associate these four middle indices with the physical index and these kind of things with the, with the virtual index. Turns out that this is a PEP, so you can just interpret this as a PEP stance, and it is the physical. These are the virtual, just make your PEPs that consist out of this, and you can immediately convince yourself that this is indeed kind of a PEPs that has all these kind of symmetries that uh, you uh, 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 want. And it turns out that uh, with this construction, you can reproduce all the string nets that, uh, uh, that people like Levin and Wen have done, but actually it's a more general way of doing it, because now somehow this is kind of done on any lattice. You don't have to do it anymore on hexagonal or whatever. This is kind of a completely general construction. And uh, obviously, there's many other solutions that you can find. You can put any operator that you want here in the middle. This will still be something that uh, is in this kind of same, uh, uh, the same phase. Um, anyway, so uh, in the last, uh, well, <laughs> should I stop? Or? Please, please keep going. <laughs> <laughs> this is so interesting. Okay, yeah, well, uh, but you will have to stop me. Because <laughs> I have many more slides. <laughs> um, let me. Let me. I, I will try to do to finish in five minutes. Okay. So, um, and please leave. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's try to understand now. Once we have this construction, so we so we characterize the the, the the symmetries. Let's try to to understand now what what anions are, what the excitations are in the system. So so what we have seen is that these red things. Okay. So we have a perhaps. These red things basically characterize the symmetries of these PEPs. Okay? So they have this, this kind of thing due to this property that you can pull them through, you can basically deform these strings. Well, it's clear that, that in topological theory, somehow the, the elementary excitations, they always come in pairs. No? You can always kind of you have onions and they always come in pairs. It turns out that they can be understood as endpoints of a string. So you have a string with an endpoint, well, this exactly will be the onion in your kind of theory. And now you want to understand basically how to construct such an endpoint. So, so given now that we have all the conditions for finding out what these MPOs are, now the question is what are now these onions? How can I construct onions? It turns out that given somehow these equations, if I go back to this, we also have these X matrices that actually map two guys to one. Okay, these are actually the fusion tensors. You can associate somehow these X's as some kind of a fusion kind of thing. Well, it turns out that um, there's a very natural candidate for putting somehow for, for just conjecturing what this endpoint should look like. Maybe you take, this is the tensor basically of the MPO. So, so this, the, the PEPs itself would be like just a circle where there's nothing here. No? You just con con construct this. This is the PEPs. When you put one of these kind of fusion tensors, you put two of these fusion tensors there, uh, maybe one that kind of goes like this and this, and then you have indeed one leg sticking out and uh, attached to this would be this whole string that you can completely deform. Well, you could just impose this. Okay? Maybe this is kind of a good candidate because this is exactly something that has a structure that I want. Now it has the structure that somehow it has an incoming thing and it just acts on the peps. You can just impose that this is an ansatz for my excitation, for my onion, and indeed you will be able to see that actually all the onions must exactly of that be of that part because of the consistency equation that we will derive. Okay, so, so we, we just impose that this is, this is an ansatz. You say my onion will be described by such kind of a construction, in which I put two of these fusion tensors. Now, obviously, if you look at this object, um, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a tensor somehow with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with five indices. Okay, so um, maybe I can somehow, this MPO has different labels. Now, this MPO, this, this label D, for example, is just labeling the different blocks that I have here. A is this link, this B, C, D, the D star, and so forth. So there's actually, there's actually five on it. Oh, yeah. There's five labels in and five labels out in this kind of, 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 of matrix mode operator that you have. But anyway, what you see is that indeed there's something like, you know, just, maybe I should kind of close. Uh, okay, so what we have is something like this, uh, like this, and then this label comes in and labels come out. So obviously you can construct an algebra of, of, of object like this. Okay? Because, I can, because this thing goes in here, I can put another kind of MPO here. This, 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 and this, and this. Okay, I can, I, I can construct my, an algebra of such objects, and I can try to understand somehow what the algebraic features are by multiplying MPOs like this. Okay, so, and um, it turns out that, that, that mathematically this, 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 this has a structure of a C star algebra, and, um, um, and it turns out that uh, the onions of your theory will correspond to the central idempotence of this algebra. So, this might seem kind of complicated learn, but at the end it's very simple. No? It's like you have this thing, you multiply it with itself, you can decompose it as a sum of kind of 
original things, so the, the product of these two can again be written as a linear combination of objects and of itself. That, that gives an algebra, and then you just put this thing in MATLAB, or you just calculate it your, your, your thing yourself. And you find out that actually there are kind of some objects that you can describe that are the central idempotents. So these are kind of basically the thing that compute with everything of your, uh, <coughs> uh, of your algebra. And these will be the onions in your theory. This is how you will be able to characterize all the elementary excitations. Okay? So the different onions will be, correspond to central item potents of this algebra. So actually, this, uh, um, so we, we, we found this out using this whole formula of matrix product operators. There's a very similar kind of framework that uh, uh, was uh, invented by uh, Chagan Wen and his collaborators, but in a completely different language. But it seems to kind of, 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 of have a very similar kind of idea, although this kind of certainly, I have a feeling that this is kind of goes further. But anyway, so, th so the, the, the whole thing is that you can form an algebra and the central item potents characterize the onions. Okay, so, uh, uh, and to give you an idea um, why this is such a kind of a nice picture of what onions are, uh, for the people that are familiar with onions, the one <coughs> thing, for example, that is very relevant is the topological spin. Okay, so, so what is the topological spin? If I have an onion and I turn it over 360 degrees, you can get a face. Okay, and normally, while well, you derive this using complicated formulas, but somehow, because we have a matrix product operator kind of version or way of representing this, this is actually very simple. Now, I have this NPO here with this kind of thing coming out. So it turns out that, the center, that, that somehow the topological spin is nothing more than indeed. So this link goes out, and you turn it around your onion and kind of come back there. This is exactly what you would do if you would turn your onion over 360 degrees. Now, using this algebra, because we have this full algebra, you just look at this, and you can indeed deduce that this thing has to be equal to e to the i phi times itself. Okay, you just calculate this, and this is actually what the topological spin is. So it's an extremely simple way of understanding this. It's, you see that actually the spin is nothing more than winding this MPO around somehow your onion, and you get your topological spin. Very, so, so, so for example, in the case of the, of the tonic codes, you will see that actually this algebra gives rise to four idempotents, and these are, of course, the four kind of onions, so the E, the M, the M, and so forth. This is, um, so what is braiding? So braiding is, again, it's also very simple. So you have like an onion here, and you have somehow another onion somewhere else, and then somehow you, uh, you yeah, just make use of somehow the algebraic properties of, uh, um, of, 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 of somehow you, you have. So the, the, the picture is that I have an onion sitting somewhere, and I take an other onion, and I want to move it through. Okay, but of course, there's many ways of doing this. You can just move it through like this. And you can say, but if I deform this kind of Wilson loop now, I actually want to kind of say that this is equal to something here. So you have a Wilson loop, another Wilson loop, and you want to pull them through each other. Obviously, they will kind of, 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 of cross each other at some point. And actually, when they cross, you will have to put an operator there. And this turns out to be exactly this braiding operator. And, uh, um, and, and you can immediately work it out and see that uh, what it is. And it just follows very easily from this matrix product operator kind of calculus. Um, um, so what are the different topological sectors then of uh, your theory? So namely, you have to just put somehow this MPO here, another MPO here. And where these two MPOs meet, you have to basically put some kind of a block. And uh, the different topological sectors, so this block here, you can actually choose it to be exactly the same central item potents as these kind of other things, and this will characterize all the ground states, the different ground states in your theory. Okay, so, um, and, uh, and so, so what is, I think, very cool is that once you have this picture in terms of matrix product operators that characterize the ground state manifold, you can also start kind of looking at what people call this modular transformation, like this S and T matrices. Well, this is extremely simple. In this case, what is a date twist? It's really kind of, it's not physically taking your system and rotating it. Okay, no, and what it is, is it's, you only have to rotate, basically you have to put a twist on the MPO of the virtual level, not on the physical states, but really only on the virtual MPOs you put some kind of a twist and then relate this kind of ground state to the original, to a linear combination of the original ones, and that's exactly how you get this these, these S and T matrix and so further. So it's, 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 it's a much kind of, it's, it's a very simple way. It's not, so typically what people do in, in, in tensor networks and, or certainly in this TRG, um, they, they would take some house system and then take another ground and then take the overlap and then you, the date twist for them would really change the whole system. That's not what is done here. It's only somehow the, the symmetry that or the, the, the kind of Wilson loop that is deformed and is living on the virtual symmetry. Anyway, uh, once you have this picture, um, you can start thinking about uh, about topological quantum computation, because what, what, why are people so interested in all these topological theories? Well, one of the main reasons is that it might lead to uh, um, um, uh, to, to, to efficient ways of, 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 uh, uh, of doing co quantum computation. And the really cool thing is once you translate somehow these MPO symmetries, so 
somehow you just can now say, okay, I have my system, my spin system with this onions and so further, and I can understand how to do braiding, what the top loading of spin is and all this. So let me kind of look at this and see that indeed I would have onions and I start kind of turning around each other. Let's look at how we would describe this on the virtual level. Let's look at what happens on the entanglement degrees of freedom. And what is very cool is if you do this, that somehow what you have on the virtual level every time you have some kind of a braiding is nothing more than a normal quantum circuit model on the virtual degrees of freedom. Okay, so, so for me this was always very magical how kind of, uh, th there's no tensor product structure in, in, in anionic kind of topological quantum computation. Now you have this braiding and there's no tensor product structure because somehow you have this, these quantum dimensions that are very strange and it's, it's kind of very counterintuitive. Well, if you re-translate somehow the, the, the braiding of of, of onions in terms of these tensor networks, you can just read off what happens on the virtual level, and that what happens on the virtual level is nothing more than a very simple kind of quantum circuit where every braiding tensor actually corresponds to a three qubit gate. Okay, and this is called actually a controlled controlled U gate, which somehow these kind of things, and indeed this gate turns out to be universal. Um, um, anyway, I, uh, if you have more questions, I would be very glad to, to talk more about this. So, this is my conclusion. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> So, so, so what, what we have is that there's only a virtual symmetry. There's no symmetry on the physical level. So, okay, I have not said this at all. It turns out, so maybe this will kind of make it clearer. So if you, um, if you would have, so how do you do SPT phases with PEPs? I didn't talk about this at all. But somehow an SPT phase would be that you apply a unitary here and you ask what has happening on the virtual level. It turns out that the right way of doing the SPT is that if you apply, if you have a matrix plot operator sitting here, and you have this unitary, that this is equal to this thing. Okay, so pulling this matrix plot operator through your kind of PEPs results in kind of doing a unitary on the physical level. This is exactly what happens in the 1D case, no? With this, this MPSs, okay? That, that somehow that you have a symmetry where you put an x through, and that this, this, this virtual representation of this projector representation, x times u times x minus 1, well, this is x u is equal to identity x here, no? And this is, and this is really the, 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 the kind of quantum version of this. Now it turns out that this is how you kind of can describe SPT phases, by really putting this u and exa exactly the same algebra of matrix product operators. Now, the only thing that happens is for truly topological phases, this you know you. So you kind of put this thing through and there's nothing happening on the physical level. So there's also a symmetry that you can impose and this turns out to be the symmetry needed for the truly topological orders. And that's the difference between topological order and SPT. The fact that there's a U there or there's no U. I don't know whether it makes it clear, but this is... Yes? If you're not having this fixed point wave function, but you have just some wave function in perhaps somewhere in the phase, is it easy to figure out how, like, what these string operators are? Well, we, we have of course thought about this, but uh, um, <coughs> in principle it should be possible because it's kind of a linear problem. No? Given somehow a PEPS, you want to find yeah, basically fine. some, I, some I, eigenspace, I uh, but uh, <coughs> we, we haven't really explored this yet. So I don't, we don't know whether it's, it's, it will work or not. In principle we know how to do it, but we have not done it. So I don't know. I really cannot so just... you have an idea for an algorithm of finding Yes, it? yes, we have an idea of an algorithm, but, but we have not really explored it yet because we don't have good enough PEPS algorithms actually to... Because of course these, these, these interesting models have actually a very large bond dimension, like, like this, if you look at this Fibonacci model, it has actually a bond dimension of 8 already. And, and a bond dimension 8 for a PEPS is already kind of... But even if you take a Tory code model and you just perturb it a little bit, I mean like you just add maybe... Oh, yeah, yeah, no, indeed. No, no, actually, actually yes, so, so, so there... Well, okay, yeah, there we have, indeed, we have actually done it, but you have to, um, so it turns out that if you, so for example, you, you take the toy code and, um, and you add a magnetic field to it, uh -huh. then, um, um, and then you would kind of, you, you so what we do is basically divide 
or tensor into two, space, uh, two subspaces, the ones that have actually the symmetries that we know that we want to impose, and the part that doesn't have the symmetry at all, not the, not the Z2 symmetry. And then we do a variational optimization over this kind of tensors, and then we basically can, you could, you could see what would be the norm of somehow the part that breaks the symmetry. And what you see is that it's exactly zero up to the phase transition, and then it starts being non-zero. This part that's, that, that, that breaks the symmetry. And this indeed comes out there. And we, we do it, but of course, we somehow, it's not entirely fair what we do because we already impose somehow the structure that we want. But nevertheless, we, we have done this exercise, and it, it, you see it very, very clearly, that exactly at the phase transition, you break your virtual symmetry. That's exactly what the topological phase transition is. And, uh, so what we, we, we have also done uh, is actually study this Fibonacci model uh, where by deforming it in a different way, by effectively kind of putting some filtering, adding some string tension to the, to the wave function, this, this Fibonacci model, and you're really studying somehow the eigenstructure of our, uh, of our uh, transfer matrix. And we indeed, indeed we see somehow that, that, that um, the topological phase transition, okay, so, so why is it so exciting is that this doesn't really fit within the London paradigm of phase transition, huh? because there's no ordered parameter or anything that breaks down. But if you look at the eigenstructure on the virtual level, the eigenstructure of the, of the, of the transfer matrices, it turns out that this is exactly well described by somehow the London, the London paradigm. So, so on the virtual and the entanglement degrees of freedom, they just follow the normal, usual Landau kind of formulas, namely that at the phase transition you have symmetry breaking. But of course this is a symmetry breaking on the virtual level that is not reflected by a local order parameter on the physical level. So there's a local order parameter on the virtual level, but if you translate this local order parameter on the virtual level to the physical level, it becomes completely non-local. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, and I think that's a very cool way of understanding topological phase transitions. By indeed mapping it to somehow this picture of the entanglement degrees of freedom, and there you can use the usual kind of Lando way of thinking about phase transitions. And this is very much compatible with, uh, with the way that uh, bias, bias, I think, I don't know, uh, and Schlingerland kind of understand topological phase transitions. Mm -hmm. This is indeed exactly kind of compatible with it. But, but the cool thing is that at least it needs, it needs you, you need to do it on the level of the virtual, of the, of the entanglement degrees of freedom. That's, that's, uh. okay. If there is no further questions, let's thank the lecturer.